Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Christine Latta. I'm the Associate Director of the Hall Center, and it is my wonderful pleasure to get to um, introduce very briefly uh, Mr. Lawrence Reese, who I, I believe a lot of you saw last night. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. Um, Mr. Reese is a former head of BBC TV history programs, the author of multiple volumes on the Nazis in World War II, and an award-winning documentarian. His BBC television series and companion books include the highly praised 1997 work, Nazis, A Warning from History, about the rise and fall of the Third Reich, told through the eyewitness testimony of those living a life under Adolf Hitler. The documentary won several awards, including the highest honor for a British television filmmaker, a British Academy of Film and Television Arts Award, and the Daily Mail called it one of the best documentary series of all times. No small, pri no small praise. Reese's 2005 work, Auschwitz, the Nazis, and the Final Solution, centers on the evolution of this notorious institution from a concentra concentration camp for Polish political prisoners to a death camp where a million Jews were murdered. The accomplishments of this work were recognized with a British Book Award for History Book of the Year. His most recent work, World War II Behind Closed Doors, is an examination of the key decisions made by Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, and an accounting through eyewitness testimony of the consequences of these decisions for those who would have to execute their plans. Mr. Reese is also the founder of the website worldwar2history.com, or www2history.com, which combines historical analyses of the events of World War II, written, I think, much of it by Reese himself, with the opportunity to engage with these subjects via online forums. The site won Best in Class awards in both the Education and Reference categories of the 2001 Interactive Media Awards. Mr. Reese was educated at Oxford. After leaving the BBC in 2008, he served as a senior visiting fellow in the International History Department at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has been awarded honorary doctorates from the University of Sheffield and the Open University, and in 2009 received the Lifetime Achievement Award from History Makers International. Please help me welcome Mr. Lawrence Reese. Now, We'll, we'll start off this morning. Uh, he has agreed to start us off by speaking for maybe about 10, 10 minutes or so, and then we will open it up to questions. We will have two uh, microphones circulating. Um, please do wait for the microphones because, as you've probably noticed, we're recording this morning, so we want to make sure that we capture all of the questions on the recording. So I will turn it over to Lawrence. That's on now. There oh, we there go. Are, hey, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Actually, maybe you'd have a better time if you couldn't hear me. I sometimes think that. Like, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so it's fantastic to come to such a fun, uh, incredible facility here. I've been really knocked out by what you've got available here in Kansas. You should really take a trip to. I mean, some of the, I, as, I, as Christine says, I'm a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics, which is an extremely august institution, part of London University. And um, I, I think if those academics came here and saw how people here are living, there'd be riots. You know. <laughs> um, which isn't to say they don't deserve every penny and all of this wonderful accommodation. It's no reason to cut back. Um, but it is extraordinary, and uh, so it's very interesting to have that insight. I thought, well, um, as Christine said, just to, to, what should I say? And I, obviously, I can't regurgitate everything I did last night, not least because you may have heard it, but also I've got no clips, so uh, I can't do that. I thought I'd just talk briefly about, uh, uh, I'm very happy, of course, at the end of this to answer any questions you have about last night as well, but I thought I'd just talk briefly about what's on, on my mind at the minute, really, which is um, the issue of why bother at all with history. And you might say, well, 
why is that an important question? It's an extremely important question in Britain. It's an extremely important question in Britain because we live in a society in Britain where 70% of children give up the study of all history at the age of 13. And that is unique in Europe. Uh, and that's happened because of various changes in the educational system. So we live in a historically illiterate society. I'm living in a historically illiterate society for the most part. The role of television in, in, in that is extremely important because television is acting very often as a primary educator to people. It's, it's actually the only history they're getting in many, many cases. Uh, when I did the series Christine mentioned on Auschwitz, we did some research into what people knew about Auschwitz. I wanted to have a sense of of, of knowledge uh, in the general population before the series went out and uh, the figures came back that for m around half the population of Great Britain the word Auschwitz was a meaningless word. They had no idea what it meant um, and uh, this was, I thought this was atrocious because on one, at one level we were criticised in, 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 in some aspects of the press for making a series about something that people said well who, you know, people know all this, especially the Second World War. People know all these things. And actually, the vast, vast, the majority of people, I think, don't. There, there is illiteracy in history. Uh, so we've allowed that to happen. And then so it seems to me we then have to answer the question, well, why does it matter? Does it matter to have a society that is going down that route? And the reason I think it does matter is because, it, in quite a profound sense, I feel that all we are is our own history. I say that because you, I remember watching uh, a, a, a program, I think it was on the news, about this, this poor man who had this terrible disease, which meant that he could no longer recall anything more than 10 or 15 seconds in the past. Um, and uh, intellectually, all his faculties were completely there. But beyond 10 or 15 seconds, he, could, th that he couldn't go back. So he was living with his wife, and his, his, he, he would... He would, he would be permanently frightened because he didn't know who this person was and, and then his wife said I'm your wife and then he'd be reassured and then every next 15 seconds he'd have to be told again and his life was over in, in all intents and purposes he had no life anymore but all he had lost was his history that was the only thing that, he, that had gone and, and, and so I think we can see in our own lives that all we are is our history we're informed only by our history and just as it is for individuals I think it is for nations too and cultures that they, they, they only have a sense of where they are and what they should do as a result of their history. So not to educate people as to what the nature of that history is, I think is a, is a, is a, is a terrible thing. It's almost a crime to do that. Uh, and that's why I think the study of history is, is so important. And not just recent history, because I think that actually you have a sense of, of, of very great value in history through looking back very often a long way, and that's because because we only have one life, if we deny ourselves the opportunity to understand how other people lived a long time in the past, we are, we are trapped in that one life. We can't really fully understand that other people have faced uh, often similar problems. Everybody has to face with the issues of, of being born, of living a life and dying, and, and different cultures and different people have tried to answer the fundamental questions about life before us, and in, in often in very different ways that we can learn from and understand. Um, Again, I'm, I was criticised when I was running the BBC that my, as well as being head of history, I was also very interested in making programmes in the area. Christine mentioned the, my own speciality, really, of, of World War II and the Nazis. And I was told that, well, we do that too much because um, I am interested in that. And, and that there was a sense that, oh, I do it, we do it because they're, they're often popular programmes. But actually, I would always say, well, no, they're not the most popular programmes we do. In any culture around the world, the most popular programs that are ever made are the history of that culture. So if you go to Canada, the most popular history series ever made in the history of Canada is called The History of Canada, 26 parts. It didn't sell anywhere else. History of Canada, the most popular program in Britain was The History of Britain. You know, you can follow it through. Uh, the Germans have just had a huge success with a series called Via Deutschen, uh, which actually was the history of Germany, but only the medieval and post-medieval periods. For, I don't know, I'm <laughs> but anyway, it was a huge success in Germany. Um, so. Uh, so you can see that the, the history of each individual culture is what's important to that culture. Uh, uh, so, so it isn't that the Second World War and the Nazis is the most, is the most uh, popular area. It isn't. It's iconic history. I often feel that coming to America, that I go into a history bookshop, I go into a bookshop and there's a history section. There's two sections. There's history and civil war. You know, so <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
so you know you don't go into a British bookshop and see that you know and 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 and, and you know the Lincoln Prize I think gives a prize to the best book on Abraham Lincoln this year you know so so I think it's it, there's, there's a, you you're interested naturally speaking in yourself in yourself your family your community and it works out like this in terms very often of historical interest um, and you can't understand where you are unless you have that history. Uh, but it's more than that, I think, because, as I said last night, I think that, for me, it isn't that history has any lessons. Uh, I remember asking, uh, when I was doing the website, I asked, uh, interviewed lots of, of academics who I, I, I've often known a long time and respect hugely, uh, and I was asking them about various aspects of the Second World War. And one of the questions I asked at the end was this question, which was, why bother with studying history in general, and why bother with studying World War II in particular? And the, the, one of the best answers I got was from a lovely man called uh, Professor Akira Irie, who's an emeritus, emeritus professor at Harvard. And he said, well, I think people should study the history of World War II so that they can stop their politicians making stupid, ignorant references to it. I thought it was a really good answer, because um, you, you see, actually, uh, um, certainly at the time of all the various problems in the Middle East, you'd see, um, we've got to attack Saddam because he's another Hitler. Well, no, he isn't, actually. He's not another Hitler, because if you know any of the structures, the, which, the way Hitler governed, they, they share the fact they're both appalling people who had to be dealt with in some way, but, but actually, they are, he isn't another Hitler. It, it, the structures and the way that all that society works and so on, he's actually more another Stalin. You know, it's like kind of, you, you don't want to go there with that. But so it's just ignorant. It's ignorant to say those sorts of things. Um, uh, equally, uh, recently, what, I can't remember, there was some fuss about should we go into Libya or something. I saw a big headline... Remember Churchill, no appeasement. Okay. Well, the problem is that actually uh, Churchill was absolutely against appeasing Hitler, but as the last project I did showed, he was appeasing Stalin like crazy, I mean, throughout the war. So the actual lesson isn't no appeasement, it's, well, be careful who you appease. You've got to be very, you know. Um, so, so there's not much of a lesson there. Um, so, so there's an issue, I think, about taking le lessons from this. As I mentioned last night, I do think there are warnings, though. I do think history is of value. I know some historians, a very good friend of mine at the LSE, who, who said to me, I said, why do you bother with history? And she said, it's just, it's, it's just interesting, you know? I said, well, she said, well, no, it's just interesting. I said, well, I said well, it could be like origami, then. You could just like, do paper. I mean, it's, and, and, and so there is a certain... There, I do know some historians who think that it, there isn't... Even as far as I go with it, you can't. But I, I don't accept that. I think that there is a series of warnings that we can take from history. Um, as I mentioned last night, I think that, that, that one of the key ones is, is understanding the fragility of everything. You know, you come here and you see these wonderful facilities in this, this sort of very ostensibly calm place, but actually we know uh, in the nature of, of, of the world that things can change in an instant. I think it's very, I think it's wonderful the way here that you have all these various plaques downtown saying what the history is, you know, and, and actually, as you know, I, I only learned recently, but you know all your lives that this town has potentially it has an extremely bloody history at some period in its life. So we know that things can change. Things can actually ch change, and they can change in an instant. And the other really important reason, I think, that people should learn history, and I want my children to learn history, is to understand why they are who they are, and to what extent, a question that I still wrestle with, is to what extent are we who we are because of the genetic inheritance we have? That's, so, so it's no good me wanting to be uh, Tiger Woods. Well, actually, I wouldn't. Know. Uh, actually, I shouldn't even go anywhere with that. But, 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 but you know, I might like to have won the U.S. Masters. I wasn't very good at golf, actually, you know, and I never really focused on it. But it would be nice. Uh, so there's no point. It, genetically, it's not going to happen. Um, uh, but on the other hand, why do I believe the things I do? Well. To a large extent, that must be because of the way I was brought up, the way I was parented, the way I went to school, the culture around me, all those things around me, which were in their turn based on history. And I can point to one uh, very uh, crucial event in the history of the Holocaust that I think was based, that happened as it did because of that na nature of history. And the history of the Holocaust, as you know, is a really grim, depressing, bleak history. But there's one, one light in it, I think, is what happened in Denmark. I don't know if you know this, but in Denmark, what happened was that um, uh, the Germans said, uh, we got, they, they decided to come for the Danish Jews. Uh, 
this got out, that this was going to happen in a few year, days' time, immediately the uh, pastors in all the churches said, we must take in Jews, uh, we must protect them. And they actually went out and they got their Jewish neighbours and they looked after them and they hid them. And then uh, uh, the majority were taken by fishermen across the sea, the narrow strait, to Sweden and neutrality and safety. And as a result, virtually the very tiny number of Jews relative to the Jewish population suffered. Uh, and this was the spontaneous action of a nation. Didn't happen anywhere else. Uh, well, why? Is that because to be Danish is to have a genetic inheritance that's different from the rest of the world? No, it's not. It's because there's a culture, a historical culture, of over years of nonconformism, of individual thinking, of um, uh, believing, um, uh, in a passionate belief in individual human rights, um, uh, a whole variety of things that all came together at that moment that meant that people knew instinctively what a Dane should do. And I think you see now that uh, uh, there's all this fuss about the, the public. It's no accident that in that country, it was that country that published the cartoons about Muhammad and everything, and they have all those problems. You know, there's no accident that that country um, would kind of go to the wire, I always feel, for issues to do with individuality and protecting the individual. Uh, I think that's to do with the knowledge of historical culture that's within it and the particular historical culture. I, of, I often feel uh, in the same kind of way, in a way, about the United States, because I feel that um, uh, because of the whole uh, uh, Declaration of Independence, because of that history, the his history in America is so much more deeply rooted and has to be because the, cons the issues of the Constitution are still so live. So therefore you cannot understand what an American should do without understanding history. You can't. It's not possible to be an American without understanding the history of America. And what's interesting is that the founding fathers who wrote that also were informed massively by their sense of history. Uh, so, you know, and I do think that that document, as it happens, is one of the most extraordinary in the history of the world because the idea that people got together and decided not to benefit themselves, not to impose a monarchy, not to say, well, let's make uh, you king and we'll all be dukes, you know? That, that this was an extraordinary thing that happened in the history of the world here uh, and then inspired the French Revolution and so on. Um, uh, so, so I think it's, it is quite extraordinary and that was to do with history. So, that, so to me, w what I see when I face Britain and I see this, this uh, massive problem in the nature of history, um, it, it fills me with a sense of despair because uh, it's extremely dangerous to lose history. And you haven't done it yet. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to say I don't feel that so much. Um, um, but I just um, passionately feel that it's important that we hang on to that. Anyway, that's what I just thought I'd open up with. Thank you very much. We have the microphone circulating, so there we go. I was an Air Force officer in Berlin, uh, West Berlin, obviously, uh, in the mid-60s. Came back short, two years after the wall fell on a, on a tour. And both, both times I had noticed something as we went through the countryside. There were no statues. There was no memorial of any war that I could find. But most startling, as we were on a tour bus, a uh, 20-something guy was giving us a great description of medieval towns and the plague and all of this. And somebody asked him about Hitler, and he had kind of a blank look. And then somebody asked him, well, what is your history during 1935 to 1945? He immediately responded, we have no German history. I'm a European. What do you... I think it's really... I think the whole way in which uh, Germany has had to deal with this past is is really is really fascinating at one level, and really it's obviously clearly tra deeply traumatic. Um, I was in uh, the town, medieval German town of Bamberg last week filming, and um, it was very interesting to me that they would have like two plaques on the on the town hall wall. One one saying um, to our fallen in the east, and the other saying in memory of the the um, atrocities committed against Jews here, and so on. So. I, I think it's enormously troubling. Um, it's enormously troubling to have 
relations, your grandfather, say, who, who you might think was a, a, great, a, a, a good man who fought bravely, but he fought bravely for a bad thing. Um, and, and, and so I think it's, it's incredibly troubling. Uh, I think something interesting is happening, uh, which is that something very significant will happen to this history when all, everyone involved in it is dead. I think that, this, that, that you know, the reason I was interested primarily, the reason I grew up interested in, in this history wasn't because, it was because actually I never saw it as history. The only way I could understand the world I lived in, the world you were in in, in Berlin, the, 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 the uh, um, splitting of Berlin, the splitting of Germany, the, the whole Cold War, um, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, um, occupation of Eastern Europe. I mean, why are there American bases in Norfolk in Britain? I mean, why are these Americans still here? Why, you know, there's a whole range of things that you couldn't understand about the world that you were in without understanding that history. So it wasn't, it wasn't possible to see it as history like the First World War even. So, but then, and my parents, of course, were in the war. My father was an RAF pilot in the war. So it was a, it was a way of understanding my parents. So something happens when that whole generation goes because then it becomes... Um, it becomes kind of quote history. I was in Germany last week, as I say, and, and one of the academics I was talking to said, "The age of the witness is over." And I thought that was really interesting because that that the, they almost feel that how oh, we've reclaimed the history to historians now. Now we, you know, because it's not a live history. And and I think that in terms of how Germany is going to deal with the, this past, it's going to become much easier to deal with it because there is no witness lobby there is no there is no passion i've noticed that in, in talks i gave when i first talked about this sort of thing in the mid 90s after the first nazi series you'd often have in the audience people who had been fighting in the war you'd have people who were in camps you know and you'd have a a, a a kind of emotional passion about this and that begins to dissipate into history because now it's like it's 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 our parents who did it or it's it's you know it's it just begins to dissipate and there's there's a plus side if you're German for that I think, uh, because you don't the, the, you're not having to deal with the the reality of my God what did my dad do or my granddad's down the road what happened that's beginning to go, but but the danger is that a whole different range of interpretations begin to be legitimised, and I know the Holocaust Educational Trust who I work a lot with in Britain, you know this is an issue about teaching this is an issue what do you do teaching the Holocaust when there are no Holocaust survivors surviving. And, and, um, and what happens to history once people who are in that history are no longer here? Uh, I think those are really, really tricky questions. Your introductory remarks made it pretty clear that different people <clears throat> will slant history differently, will understand the same history in different ways. Absolutely. And this is a, a phenomenon that has come to the attention of scholars a few years ago under the name of the invention of tradition. And what's always interested me about it is that both historians and anthropologists have been very interested in the invention of tradition, but in different ways. Because it seems for historians, many of them anyway, the idea or the goal is to strip away the distortions, the inventions, and try to get at what really happened. Anthropologists, on the other hand, have tended to have the notion that history itself is a matter of coloring, of <clears throat> interpretation, and thus the authentic history, the in thing of interest to anthropologists is how it is and why it is yes. that history is colored the way it is because of contemporary agendas. Yes. I'm just wondering in your work with your interviews and other things, if you've come across that issue and how you uh, cope with it. Well, I think that's a very um, insightful question. Um, I think that's right. And I, I much more tend toward, my interest is other people. I'm interested in history because I'm interested in trying to deal with what it is to have a life. And I don't think you can deal with what it is to have a life unless you try and understand and learn through history. I was never interested in history as a kind of, uh, per se, I, I was always interested in what history could tell me and I could learn from history. And uh, that's why I'm interested in history, which I think, I guess, would put me in your analysis on the anthropological side, and certainly the psychological side. That's what has in, always interested me. And that's, I'm not sure I would have spent so long on this if I hadn't been able to have met people who were there. 
um, because there's a difference when you can interrogate somebody who was a guard at an SS in Auschwitz who um, did meet Hitler, who did make decisions. There's, a, there's a, a real sense of touching this history that way and of trying to understand how they felt. Um, I was always teased by some of the people who worked with me that the only question I was ever interested in asking anyone was, how did it feel? How did you feel? Which at one level is a sort of ahistorical question. People don't, you know, they're not, um, they're not really, I don't think, quite so interested, some historians, in that. Um, and you mentioned to understand what really happened. You see, I'm kind of of the view that it's very, very hard to ever understand what really happens. Because if you look at your own life, you know, I was discussing something with my wife the other day, and I appear to have come away from that discussion thinking something happened that didn't happen. And I was in the discussion. Um, she's of the view that there were things happening in that discussion that I didn't think were happening. Um, well, that's an example of my own history that I lived through, and I, I couldn't write down. I could write down what I think really happened, but then there would probably be a divorce because she would write down what she thinks really happened, and then we'd need a lawyer to work out well, what really happened. And I think, in fact, even if you had a camera in the room showing in quotes what really happened, once you start doing that, you know, the issue is who's the camera on? I mean, what, what version of the, you know, is it, non, is it not edited then? Is it, you know, the, the, you know, there are real issues about, I mean, you know in a football game kind of, well, actually, you don't even know in a football game often what really happened, do they? You know, so, uh, so there's an issue uh, in terms of, un, you know, how do you uncover um, uh, why Hitler was able to influence so many people. I'm not sure you can, you can come up with views about, well, it could have been this, it could have been that, it was probably this, this is something to think about, and so on. But I'm not sure you can say, six reasons, this is it. Oh, next question, move on. Which is why history keeps being reinvented, because the historian is as, mu is as crucial to the history as the history. So you find that, that history is reinvented almost by each generation. For it needs to find in it what it needs to find for itself. The Nazis were constantly doing this with their own history, with, you know, Vikings, thus we see, you know, Himmler's uh, um, interest in um, deep German history, the Teutonic Knights and, and, and all these various things. They were picking things up. In fact, Hitler, you know, hate to quote Hitler, but he did say a very interesting thing. The first thing to understand about Hitler was, this is scary, don't let it put you off, but Hitler was the only, history was the only subject Hitler was any good at. Hitler was really interested in history. Um, he saw history as incredibly important. And he, uh, but he, re he read it not to understand, he read it to get e evidence to support the views he had. So he was like a, 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 like a prosecution or defense lawyer looking in history for bits that, that fitted what he wanted to do. Um, and uh, you know, he was once in his table talk in, uh, in the Wolf's Lair in Rastenburg in East Prussia during the war, which was recorded, um, he once said, um, he said, the thing about history is people only take from the past what is convenient from them. And I think there's quite a lot of, of truth in that, that actually, th that when you, some people are writing, you're writing history, you take from the past the bits that are convenient. And we all have to kind of watch out for that, I think. I, I have another uh, fascinating question of history to offer. Um, I teach a class on... Closer? Is this better? Yeah. yeah, thanks. I teach a class on the Holocaust, and so the, the short version of this question is why anti-Semitism? What I mean is um, you can see evidence of persecution in Roman times, medieval Spain and Portugal. When it comes to your period, they're the Nazis, of course, but perhaps in Europe there were places where it was even more virulent than it was in Germany. Why? Why well, the animosity uh, you know, toward as, Jewish people? Uh, you know, I mean, people have, uh, that, that's, um, peop I know people have spent lives trying to answer that question, so, but I have the answer. No, I don't know. I know, um, <laughs> I know what it is. The, it's, the answer is 38. No, I, um, it, it's obviously, it's the most extraordinarily huge question. And, um, uh, there are clear, uh, I mean, David Cesarani, the uh, brilliant professor in, in Britain, has just written this wonderful uh, 
guide to all this for the Holocaust Educational Trust. And you know, he points, as you do, to a whole range of historical uh, events going right the way back. The notion, for example, that um, uh, uh, Jews became associated with banking, with money lending in ways that uh, the Christians couldn't, that therefore they started going into occupations uh, um, uh, aid, uh, as bankers or as middlemen, traders and so on, which, which were always going to be vulnerable um, to uh, 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 other people attacking them. Uh, I always remember one of the, the, the most ghastly person, people we, we filmed for the Auschwitz series, who was a guy called Hans Friedrich, who was involved in shooting uh, Jews at close range during the Holocaust. And uh, he was asked, why did he do this? And he said, I've always hated the Jews. And he said, why? why? And he said, well, because they used to cheat us when they came around buying our pigs. He said, you know, we'd sell them the pig for, for like uh, um, 50 marks, and then you'd see it down the, um, in, the local, in the local town market for 100. I can't remember the figures, something like that. And, they said, and, and, and uh, Michaela Lichtenstein, who was doing the interview, said, well, but, I mean, you could have taken it. I mean, th th they were doing a job. I mean, they were going along, getting a pig, and then they're trading it. Yeah, but it was just, they were making too much, they were making a fortune off us, pigs, you know. And, and so I think that in, in that, in a tiny way, encapsulated a sort of sense of, well, what, a, you know, he felt, well, they're not making it. They're not, you know, we got the pig, and they've just got the pig and taken it there and got more money for the pig. It seems. You know. So that was the basis of his whole hatred. And of course, um, you know, obviously it's more than that. It's culture. It goes back long. But the fundamental aspect of it was was, uh, I, I think, to do aspects of it was to do with that. Obviously, of course, you've got the Christian Church hugely encouraging this in some areas. You, you know, anybody, you should read what Martin Luther said about the Jews. I mean, just absolutely. Frankie, you know, I mean, virulent material that he said about the Jews. So, so you have you have that whole body um, of opinion against it. You also, I think, have something deeply psychological about that. It must be so primitive. The need never to blame yourself it goes back to my discussion with my wife. Actually, anyway, the need <laughs> never to blame yourself, um, uh, but but the, the need to always think it's somebody else's fault. It's tremendous in life to do that if you can. Actually, you know, it's not worked out for me because it's your fault. That felt good. Yeah, it's great, you know. The reason I haven't got on is because there's a conspiracy of these people not to give me the job. It wasn't because I'm useless, it's because of you. Now, I think that there's a it's just brilliant to be able to do that because um, it just it absorbs you, you know. You see the way... Um, uh, um, it's fascinating, you know. I love. I'm very interested in football, Sp Spanish football, particularly, uh, the, and the, the rivalry between Barcelona and Real Madrid in, is extraordinary in, in Spain. And there's an extraordinary manager, a coach of Real Madrid called Jose Mourinho, and they have a problem because Barcelona is the best football team in the world. Incredible talent. So, how do you deal with motivating your um, uh, players when actually, in many respects? That the Barcelona team is unfortunately better, you know, they're really good. So how do you do that? Well, what you do, I don't know if, he, and again, I don't know, I don't know if, if he knows any history, it doesn't, I mean, but I, I don't know. But, and I don't know if, if, if this is done intuitively or not, but what he's managed to do is to make, I think, his team believe there is a conspiracy against them by referees supporting the Barcelona team, so that when they tackle the Barcelona team, they're automatically like sent off because they. You know. So there's a sort of sense that, well, yeah, well, you know. So so if you lose, it's not necessarily that you lose because unfortunately they appear to have more talent. You lose because um, well, I'm seeing the deep forces at work here. I think you know. now um, now I exaggerate. I'm sure he's not saying it quite those terms, but that's how it comes across. He's been I think he's been disciplined by the Spanish Football League for. For, for, for kind of these sort of protests about uh, the refereeing decisions. And so on. But, but you can see how if you're interested in motivational techniques, how much better to say to people, look, I'm afraid, um, you see, they're better, unfortunately, and that's why we, we're losing. You know? Uh, you know, they're really good. You know? No, you, you, where are you going to get with that? Whereas if you say, listen, there are things, you know, if we can just, and, 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 and so there's a motive, there's a whole sense much easier. Um, oops, sorry. Pulling off my Britney Spears look here. Um, it much easier to to you know. Hitler understood completely 
um, you know, and I'm making no comparisons between <laughs> contemporary events and that, but, but Hitler understood completely that it's much, much easier to define a political party, an organization, by what you hate than what you believe in. So that, so that actually, you, you know, if you can, if you could, you know, if we actually sit around here and say, okay, what are the changes we want to make in Lawrence to make it, you know, we, no one would you go, oh, I want to do this, well, no, no, no. But if you say, what's wrong? Who are the people that's wrong here? It's not us. We're the best. It's them. Well, suddenly, oh, actually, yeah, it's true. It's true, you know. So, so the, 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 the motivation through exclusion and the thing that Hitler had going for him was that less than 1% of Germans were Jews. So it's not even like you're excluding a large number of people. You're, 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 you're talking about, and also it's this thing about conspiracies. You watch all these programs on these cable channels like, you know, JFK wasn't shot. Um, we never went to the moon. I sometimes wonder if, the, if, if it's like kind of the person who shot JFK was on the moon or some of these, they all kind of like merge into one program in my mind. You know, the Holy Grail. Was it really a source of evil? Or so? I know it's like kind of there's a clearly psychologically a deep desire in the human psyche to believe in. Um, I must relate to an outside for you know outside hidden forces. It must be partly. It must be to do with this wrestling with the notion that I think of fragility that that actually that that we're the only animal that has a consciousness that we're going to cease to exist. And there's a brilliant book by an American uh, um, psych, uh, psychologist, one of the most profound books I've ever read, called Denial of Death by uh, Becker, Eric Be uh, Bernard Becker, is it? Becker, anyway. And it's a profoundly influential book in my life because he talks about how uh, the fundamental thing that we have to deal with as human beings is wrestling with the notion that we are, we know, our consciousness, consciousness and our knowledge of history tells us we're here, but that in, a, in, in one second, we needn't be here anymore. And, and wrestling with that, whilst carrying on pretending it isn't going to happen, or, or, or uh, um, it might happen, but there's, religion is a huge comfort here, of course, or, or you know, whole range, but the, 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 we're wrestling with that. I think it's somewhere in there that the whole kind of notion of dark forces, of conspiracies, of our predisposition to believe these things is coming from. I was, uh, lat I was at your uh, presentation yesterday evening, and I was struck by two of the clips particularly of the matter-of-fact way that the woman who, uh, I think, informed on her neighbors, and then the man who actually participated in the executions, I was struck observation I was struck by the matter of fact way they could sit and talk about that and I but my question to you is I have read different accounts of how much the international community knew about what was happening in Germany with reference to the Jews I've heard that the international community knew very little and then I've heard that we knew including the United States we knew for some time do you have an observation or your thought and your research as to how how long did the international community know what was going on in Germany with reference to the treatment of the Jews? Again, that's a very complex, uh, it, uh, um, it, the answer is very complex because um, what is happening grows, grows over time and it grows uh, um, often in moments of, it, uh, moments of sudden change and then it'll go and then sudden change. Uh, and in a way, I think evolution is often like that generally, which is that it isn't like kind of this, it's that, and then like this, and then that. So you had moments of sudden explosions of anti-Semitic hatred, followed by still persecution, but a, rel a relative, relatively less than the moments. So um, this, it's clear from the very beginning that Hitler is deeply anti-Semitic. Um, uh, that's obvious. It's clear that he wants, as he sees it, quote, a solution. Uh, to what he sees as a quote problem with the Jews, um, but and it's possible to understand that uh, if you're a foreign government as being notions of denial of citizenship, of maybe forced expulsion and so on. Uh, um, so there's no sense, uh, I think, that the, the, that in, in foreign governments that um, right up to 1938 that this is exterminatory, that this is going to be 
um, uh, mass murder on the scales that it happened. I'm not even sure in Hitler's mind that he he's worked out any of this. I think he um, uh, we can't really penetrate that mind, but I think that what what is what he's thinking about is um, a kind of visceral hatred and a wanting rid of rid rid. This is what he's thinking, and that rid of can can take different forms at different times and. So in terms of the international community, I think that the, 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 the big thing, if, we, if we're going to really reproach people, and again in history it's difficult to go back and a, sky, a slight blame, you know, but if you're going to reproach, there's a number of key moments. One is the 1938 Evian Conference, where it's clear uh, uh, that uh, in the wake of the Anschluss, the occupation of Austria, that Hitler uh, uh, and the, the Nazis are, are, are escalating and that, they, that there's, a, again, a sense of get rid of. And there is a conference held at Evian, um, which Roosevelt, in fact, is very keen on happening. But what happens at this conference of international bodies is that they all, everyone stands up and says, yes, it's terrible that the uh, Nazis are persecuting the Jews, but unfortunately, we, we can't really take many. You know, it's a bit of a problem. Right? And, and so pre-war, the, the, that Evian conference, I think, is crucial in, in terms of lack of response. It isn't that the governments there are thinking we know they're all being killed um, because they're not demonstrably all being killed. You know, so it, it's not, you can't blame in terms of people for that, but nonetheless, there's a sense in which there's a growing uh, issue and, and the, the America and Britain don't choose to um, take these people. Now, you could argue, of course, um, there's a growing war in Somalia. But we're not taking Somalia. So, so you know, what can a country do in, in that? You know, you could, there's a bigger. So, then, in terms of knowledge of the death camps, it's normally focused around. Um, uh, it isn't really until 1943 that there's really much knowledge that this has become um, uh, exterminatory, and it isn't until the summer of 1944, the spring of 1944, that absolute knowledge of what's going on in Auschwitz in terms of 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 the crematoria and gas chambers and so on becomes known. And then there is a key series of exchange of documents relating here to the US uh, uh, government, at which it's clear that there was a, a decision taken not to bomb Auschwitz, not to bomb the transport lines into Auschwitz. Um, historians have argued a lot about why that decision was taken, about could it have done any good, um, about was it uh, uh, vaguely anti-Semitic in its decision. There's certainly a case in the British documents where you see that there's a sense that, oh, well, these Jews are exaggerating. There's a sense that, um, well, what could we do with it? You know, it would destabilize our culture, a place to take lots of, you know, there's a real sense of that. So, um, you know, myself on the analysis, actually, is I don't think it would have made any, been of any value to save any lives by bombing Auschwitz at that point for a load of very, very detailed reasons I can go into, but uh, so, but that's not, to me, the issue is that at the very least, there is no enthusiasm to move in and help. I think if you'd gone to Hitler in, in 1939 and said, look, we're sending all these ships, to give us all these Jews, he'd have taken them. Um, but, we, but nobody knew at that point it was going to be at this point, so, which isn't much of an answer, but the answer is, so the answer kind of, I guess, is growing knowledge and, and at the very least, lack of care and concern. You talk about, you talk about the denial of death, but before I hand this to this gentleman for a question, the denial when the ashes are falling on you, I, I think of Shoah by Lanzmann, the, sm the stink in the air, the ashes falling on you, and then the sense of, oh, but we didn't know. My mother, who was of that generation, said, why did we know within the Jewish community, and yet people would deny it? Um, it's, a, it's a forceful uh, sense of denial, a willful sense of denial, and not just ignorance. I, I just wanted to give that. Yeah, and I'm sure that's right. On the other hand, how they would argue up until 1943 is what could we do? What could we do? What could we do? Because it, it wasn't until summer of 1944 that bombers were in range of any of these places. 
Um, and the view was taken, the British government took the view, the American government took the view, that the way we stop this is to win the war as quickly as possible. That's when we stop it. That's how we stop it. Um, so so uh, uh, there's evidence coming out. Uh, I've seen papers of, of the Soviets, for example, are committing the most appalling atrocities uh, uh, as they move into eastern Poland in uh, the autumn of 1939. And I've seen documents in the British government which are showing this, which is showing the most terrible things. We weren't even at war with the Soviet Union at that point, and yet we knew what they were doing. Uh, appalling cases of, of total uh, re of kind of re-education, in quotes, of that society. Um, so you're dealing with things across your desk all the time of the most appalling, unspeakable crimes. Um, I don't think it's until 1943 they're beginning to understand that, that what is happening here uh, it, it is of a different conceptual level. Um, I'm interested in the impact of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. My own research focuses kind of on minorities and how these shape, that is, how the Holocaust or anti-Semitism or anti-black feeling ends up shaping the group. One of clearly the impact with the Holocaust on many, many people, we have these uh, American politicians who discover that their parents were Jewish and refugees. So one of the impacts is to say, being Jewish is such a disability that I will deny my children the history of that because I want them to be ordinary people and not live. And so um, the degree to which all Jews are bankers, there were agricultural communities, not only the kibbutzim, in Israel, but even in Kansas. Yeah. So the way that you say if Jews are non-productive, back to the land movement. Uh, blacks, there are many parallels. And so we see the continued generational impact of things like the Holocaust as it has shaped the survivors. Yeah. Much of the culture was destroyed. But for those who survive, they've had to deal with these kinds of things. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I think that's absolutely that right. I completely agree. I completely agree. I think that um, what we always see with history is that then you're immediately informed by that history into change very often. And I think I was really struck by my uh, visit to Israel filming. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we were filming various Holocaust survivors in Israel. And I, I interviewed this um, uh, one chap who was um, in the had been in the um, I think it was the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and uh, there was an incredibly strong sense that he wanted to prevent, to, to to talk about that he wasn't one of the kind of he didn't use these exact words but the sense I got was that he wasn't one of these weak Jews you know and I, and, I, and and that you know I wouldn't have gone into those I wouldn't have gone in those I would have fight fought I'm going to think and. And it just struck me that, that there was this sense there, and I was reading on this and talking to some of the academics, that there's a sort of sense in some quarters that to have been a, a Holocaust survivor from a camp was in some way kind of, well, you know, come on, you didn't really, you know, fight, you weren't, why weren't you doing something about this? Which I think is this horrendous calumny. I mean, I, I feel very, very strongly that, that about this because I, I've, I understand how the, the, the system of arrival at Auschwitz and these death camps worked. I understand the options that people had in those situations. You know, it is just a crime against these people, a crime against people to say they should have, res should have been resistance or something. You know, this is simply un an impossibility in the vast majority of cases. And yet, they were dealing there clearly with a sense that we are not kind of patsies, we are not people who be pushed around, we are not, you don't, you know, I thought it was very interesting at the time of the, um, the, the, I think it was the very first Gulf War. I see, I remember reading some quote, uh, um, I can't remember if it was a politician in Israel or a leading commentator in some ways, when, when um, Saddam Hussein was trying to launch these scuds that might have had poison gas against Israel. And they were saying, you know, nobody gasses Jews now, you know. And you thought, okay, so you knew that, and, and I know that there must have been a sense that if, if he had, and in a way, what he was trying to do was to think, if he launched, you know, I think Saddam was thinking, if he launches one of these things, who knows what the reaction is going to be from it? Because, so, so, you know, I don't know enough about the contemporary politics of Israel to make a judgment on this, but the sense I got was a society that, that is, you know, not going to be pushed around. This is, this is different. 
this is different. Now, how that historical memory then informs actions today, again, who, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know enough to know, but I do know that, that um, uh, the sense of victimhood that was created there is bound to have repercussions of the kinds you're talking about. I'd like to move forward a bit chronologically and go to post-war Germany with, with the division between, and we had populations growing up in the West and populations coming in the East. And how has their perception of the history of those days affected the reuni reunification of Germany and the German people? Well, I was in Germany shortly after the war came down, and um, uh, I was just struck then, and I'm still struck today, by what I perceived as the enormous rush from the East to eliminate that memory. So it's like kind of it, so I don't feel, it's very strange driving around Germany now. It's only, well, it, it's not only, it's 20 years, I suppose, but, but there is, that I don't get that sense at all of, of um, uh, it's, I mean, it's fascinating how it seems to me that the, whatever belief system that was imposed or chosen within East Germany, to me, in my perception of the people I know from there, seems to have kind of like almost vanished like mist in the sun, just in a way that whatever was going on with Nazism didn't and hasn't necessarily. And I think it's to do with... Um, <coughs> So many people, like the people you saw in those clips last night, uh, believing, truly believing, that what was happening in the 1930s was a good thing, was right. And, and it's very difficult to then shift that belief out of yourself. I don't know how many Germans believe that what was happening in the occupation of East, in, of East Germany and the way they were being dealt with under the Soviets was good and right. You know, Hitler, we, we must remember, was, was elected um, by constitutional means to be Chancellor of Germany. I mean, he was not... He's not like Stalin. He's not like um, uh, these dictators who seize power. It's called in German the seizure of power, but, but actually he was, he, he was, he was, the Nazis were by far the biggest party and they, the um, elite, the governing elite in Germany have to deal with him because he's, he gets 40% of the vote. And in a multi-party system, I mean, that's enormous. So, so it's different from what was going on in East Germany. So... What to me is curious is that, is that it went so much. Um, and, and I think partly that's because the neighboring countries, Poland and, 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 and Hungary and so on, all then became democracies too. So it wasn't even like they were facing a next door neighbor who was like this. I remember that we're talking about the plasticity of, of, of human culture and, and belief. And, and that was summed up to me by a guy I interviewed in 1999 in East Germany, in, in former East Germany. And I wanted to interview him for a program series we were doing about the Hitler-Stalin war and he was a member of the Hitler Youth uh, when I think he was 14 or 15 and had, had been chucking these petrol bombs at tanks, Russian tanks as they came in and uh, we interviewed him about this and his belief about that at the time and then after the interview we were talking about well what happened to you and he said you know it's been an incredible life he said because I was totally convinced in the rightness of, of uh, Nazism and Hitler and so that I was always willing to give up my life as a kid chucking these petrol bombs and you know and then actually I I was actually captured by the the Soviet soldiers and he said it was it only took a matter of it was almost instant he said I suddenly realized that everything I'd been taught by Hitler was wrong and that actually the only future had to be socialism and and communism and I re suddenly had this awakening and I realized that and he did extremely well uh, under Communism. He grew up in East Germany and he became mayor, communist mayor of his local town and big figure in the community. I said that, and I said, so what's happened since um, the fall of the Berlin Wall? Now it's democratic. And he said, well, you won't believe this. But it was only moments after the wall fell that I had this incredible moment. My eyes were suddenly open. <laughs> and I realised that everything I'd been taught up to that point was wrong. And actually... The way forward had to be capitalism, and clearly communism was not working. And now he's, he had this factory, he was doing incredibly well, he was doing, making a fortune. Now, now, I'm not saying that all human beings are like that, because of course, demonstrably they're not, but some human beings are like that. Um, and, um, you know, and he'd had a very good life. 
he prospered under every single system that came along. You know, and, and I dare say if the you know, Aztecs arrive and it's human sacrifice, we'll go, you know, the more I think about it. You know. I would like you to, uh, if you would comment on the relationship between your documentaries uh, and the uh, greater entertainment film world. And I'm particularly thinking right now of what you said about uh, the passivity of the Jews and did they uh, notice or not. Uh, the movie The Debt, and there is a scene in it which has been quoted in the reviews where our character, which is uh, creative fiction, was really based on Dr. Mengele saying that to his captor, uh, that, um, who's an Israeli condo, uh, commando, that the Jews knew how to die. The problem was they didn't know how to fight. And then he kind of goes on about the numbers in the camp uh, and the few guards that were, and why didn't they you know, organize and rise up and revolt? Well, the, of course, the answer to that is that they did, in occasions, witness the Warsaw Ghetto. What I'm concerned about is, as you said, our young people, and this is true in the United States, are really not studying history in the kind of supervised, uh, legitimate way that uh, we would like to see uh, our children and grandchildren study history. They're getting it from television, from the movies. And this relationship between your uh, documentaries, which fall in the broad category of oral history, and what is being produced uh, in Hollywood and elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know how long we've got, because you know, you've now hit on one of my huge, great, in fact, anybody in my family tries to avoid me getting near this one, because it just makes me so crazy, really. I mean, it makes me so crazy, because, um, uh, well, in the first place, I don't watch drama in this area, because it just upsets me. It doesn't upset me because I get upset by it. I get upset by it. I get upset by kind of what someone's done to the history. Um, we ended up, uh, when I was running history, having to d doing more and more drama in these kind of documentaries. And I've always felt I had uneasiness about that because the drama sensibilities and documentary sensibilities are, at one level, they come quite close, but actually there's, a, there's this narrow, deep chasm between the two. And uh, it's like people in drama who, who say to me, I say, well, the trouble with that film is it's inaccurate in, in, in these eight key ways. And they go, the thing is, Lawrence, you don't understand, drama's about a greater truth, which is a lie. That's what's interesting. The greater truth of drama is a lie. Drama's a lie. And, um, uh, and it, dry, it just drives me crazy. I'll give you one, I mean, and, and, and so I'll give you one example that, that uh, has driven me crazy for a very long time. The, you know the film Bridge on the River Kwai? Mm -hmm. Alec Guinness did not blow up that bridge, okay? <laughs> Um, uh, the bridge, uh, you can visit the bridge in the River Kwai in Kachinaburi in Thailand. It was never blown up. Um, it was a very successful part of the uh, Japanese railway system. Uh, trains still cross it. Um, it uh, uh, was built not by British architects who were helping the Japanese in collaboration. It was built by Japanese architects. The British did not help design the bridge. Um, basically, every, almost every single component part of that story is, is a lie. It, it, it was, the, 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 the book was written, I think, and we're guessing now, but it was written in part by a French guy motivated by writing about the nature of collaboration. The French had been under attack for collaborating with, um, uh, uh, with the Nazis. And here was an instance, so-called, of collaboration by British prisoners of war, or allied prisoners of war, or Australian prisoners of war with the, the Japanese. Um, it, it simply didn't happen along the lines that's in that film. And yet every year that film's trotted out. So I thought when I became a position of, of at least some influence in television, I decided I'm going to run a, and we're going to do something about this. So I commissioned a program called The True Story of the Bridge and the River Kwai, which is a really good documentary made by a producer called Paul Alston. And it was all about Colonel, uh, the real colonel who was running that bridge, who was this incredibly honourable guy who, you know, it, it, was, it was taking apart this myth of the bridge and the require. And it was shown. And then, and then I noticed over Christmas, one Christmas, the, the schedulers had said, hey, you've got this film, uh, Myth and the Bridge and the Require. And I said, yeah, it's, it's great. We'll use it as an excuse to show that first and then rerun the feature film. 
I'm going to sprint it. And then, and then I looked at the audience figures, and of course the audience figures for our little documentary on the Myth of Bridge of Cry were about a quarter of the audience for the feature film. So I'd actually participated in more people watching the feature film than would otherwise have watched it. Um, and, and, and so, I kind of, I'm in this, you know, there's no point in getting upset about it because, you know, um, people, didn't get up, people don't get upset about Shakespeare's portrayal of Richard III, which is historically inaccurate. I mean, you know, they've been doing this for, for, for this is what dramatists do. But if you know the history, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and it's like Schindler's List. You know, you don't criticize Schindler's List. Okay, I will criticize Schindler's List. The, uh, Schindler's List um, uh, the, you know, it's very often in drama, in my experience, not even that there's inherent inaccuracies, it's that what a dramatist will do is want to focus only on this because they think it's what they, what they want to have. So, for example, the portrayal by Fines in that of, the, of the, the, the camp commander going around, you know, shooting people out of the... the remember the scene where he shoot? Oh, I feel like being evil today, shoot people. Um, uh, now, now, that's not inaccurate of that guy in real life. Um, because he, the, the Goth was a was a total sadist, was a dreadful, you know. That's not inaccurate. The problem is, if that's the camp commander you choose to show, it becomes in people's minds what the camp commanders were, and actually, very large numbers were not like that at all. The commandant of of the biggest site of mass murder in the history of the world, Auschwitz, was a man called Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess was described to us by the prosecutor who dealt with him at Nuremberg as being the mo one of the most normal people you could ever meet, like a grocery clerk. He was just this totally kind of together guy. I don't know, anyone ever saw him lose his temper. He never went around, you know, there's no evidence he ever laid hands on anybody. Um, this is a guy who is totally focused, is committed to what they're doing, is trying to solve problems, is believes in the mission. You know, and, and he is, you could see him sitting here and he'd be, per, you, there's no foaming, there's no big red, you know, there were people like that, of course, in that organisation, but the commandant of, of Auschwitz was not like that, Heinrich Himmler was not like that, Reinhard Heydrich, the leading SS killer, was not like that. But you create an image of what people want. It's much easier to understand this history if you think they're all wackos. And that's what, so, so, for all those reasons, I've got, I've got issues with the drama. Anyway, I think you probably grab I've got issues with, with, with drama on this. Uh, I was impressed uh, with those two clips about people that were in denial about their participation uh, in the Nazi uh, thinking and revolution or, or activities. And then it, it made me have some insight into us, uh, and this is not about the Nazis, but uh, this country, our, our history, is that Europeans invaded a country that was already occupied by what we considered to be savages, in spite of the fact they were pretty highly organized societies. Uh, and the things that we did to them and continue to do uh, and how we seem to accept that as normal, uh, uh, the normal uh, evolutional way things should have been. And we have, uh, you may not know, that we have a university here, another university in Lawrence. It's called Indian Nations University. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was founded in an effort to take this, these organized societies and make them civilized. And so we took their children and tried to civilize them. Now, we accept that. That's a part of our culture. And we, but we continue to have battles over what are called the wetlands around here because they once belonged to the Indians. We want to build a highway through there. We've been arguing for 15 years about it. Uh, but we, you know, it's easy for me to criticize how those Germans were. But when I look at ourselves, I wonder if we don't deny a lot of things that we shouldn't be denying. And I don't know if you have any feelings or knowledge about our American history in, the, in that part, but I thought it was interesting in your comments. Yeah, I think that's a very important and profound insight. I really think that because I was talking to Vic about that yesterday, actually. Um, uh, there are two things I'd say to that. The first is, you know, you sh if you read Hitler's table talk when he's talking about what he wants to do in the East, 
what you have to understand about Hitler is that that he, as I say, he 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 goes to history a great deal to analogies as to why things are possible. And the two things he talks about in in defense of the fact that he is trying to conquer in the Soviet Union, he is trying to conquer a huge territory which is with many, many, many more people in it than he has. He points to two things over and over again. The first is the British occupation of India. And I grew up when the British Empire was pretty much gone, so it's very hard for me to, to get a handle on this, but at the time the British Empire was huge and the jewel and the crown, so say, was the British occupation and the British control of India. And Hitler essentially says, and I paraphrase to these people, listen, don't talk to me about how race isn't important. How is it possible that a few tens of thousands of English people control millions of people in India if it isn't that we're racially better? And then he also points to America and he said, let me tell you, and then paraphrasing again, what we're going to do in the East. We're going to take these people and we're going to uh, deliberately not educate them. We're going to treat them as a nation of slaves. We're going to give them, he said, go down, some, I can't remember, somewhere he talks about, let's, we'll give them trinkets, little mirrors and little trinkets, you know, and we'll, we'll in the East, we'll occupy it and treat them like slaves, just like the Americans have done to the Red Indians. So he has two, two um, ideas in his head of nations that have gone into territory, conquered empires, and either exterminated or rendered neutral the people who are in it, the British in India and the Americans here. So he, is, he, he can see this, this is something he is, he is aware of and so when it comes then, uh, you know, interestingly enough the Japanese are aware of this. The Japanese keep on talking about their parallels to Britain, they are an island nation who want an empire and they want their empire in China. And, and uh, uh, they are also aware of what the Americans do, have done. So, so therefore both Germany and Japan think that Britain and America are a nations of appalling hypocrites. Um, because what happens in, 19, in the early 1930s with the League of Nations is essentially we tell Japan that it can't have China. And they say, uh, why? And they say, oh, because we don't do that kind of thing anymore. So they're going, oh, okay, so the only, in the sort of famous story about Germany is the book that's called The Nation Born Too Late, meaning that Oh, it was just our bad luck. If we'd done all this in the night, if we'd got together as empires a, a hundred years before and gone into the Soviet Union and massacred everybody and, and made it our empire, that's fine, like you did in America or India. That's okay. It's just that now you've done it, got it, taken up the drawbridge and gone, I'm sorry, it's disgusting what you're doing. It's appalling. Well, you weren't giving up. I don't see you giving up America back to the Native Americans and I don't see Britain giving up India. So they're hypocrites, appalling hypocrites. So that's how they saw it, and I, and, and I think therefore there are issues. So, so there are issues that you have to wrestle and grapple with about that. You know, I, I had this extraordinary trip uh, a few years ago when I was in Banff at the Banff TV Festival, and then flying out of Calgary, and then I was in uh, doing an interview with someone in Durban in South Africa, and then I was doing another interview with filming in Australia, and I had this weird experience in the um, airport. Uh, 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 shops, which shows you my experience of culture. I take a lot of judgments from airport souvenir shops, and um, and and in ba and in Calgary Airport souvenir shop, it was awash with Inuit sculptures to take home. You know these sort of weird. Uh, there seem to be a lot of whales, not not seals. You know, all these things, and that was the sh thing you could buy from Calgary. And then you go to uh, Durban, uh, and it was full of Zulu um, sort of uh, things you could buy. And you go to uh, Sydney Airport, and it was full of Aboriginal artefacts. And I thought, this is really strange, isn't it? I said, in two out of the three countries, they basically managed to kill or neutralize these people who made all these artefacts. And in one, there were just too many. And I thought, that's a very dangerous reading of the history. But I don't know quite why it's not the case. Um, so that, that actually, you know, um, it's kind of what happened, and uh, it, it, you know. But on the other hand, uh, how do you beat yourself up over your? I mean, you know, kind of like as they say, we didn't do it. So that we sound a bit like the Germans, don't we? No, we did. I didn't do it. Um, 
uh, and it and it did happen. And there must be a sense in which, if something happened 100, 200 years ago, there must be a sense in which the people who did that, you know, the, the, there's a cultural moment when that's happening, when there's a legitimacy kind of right around it, I'm not expressing myself very well, that's clearly not happening in Germany. In Germany what's happening is that there's a cultured nation at the heart of Europe that takes a turn back into this. Well, that's not what we were doing. So there'd been a sense of movement forward, but it doesn't kind of excuse it. And how you then deal with it as a society, how you deal with kind of um, these issues, these live issues today, I mean... I don't know. That's why you know. That's why I'm not in. in um, I, mean, I deal with the past. I don't know. I couldn't deal with the present. Um, someone made the comment that the youth is only being taught history through film and various shows on TV. Are you dissatisfied with the way the youth are being taught history? And how do you think the youth should be taught? Um, I don't know enough about it to make a judgment. Um, uh, the, 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 the issue of uh, there's kind of several issues to unpack there really I think one, one is there's a very I'm, I kind of insofar as I do understand it in Britain I understand and support the views of a man called Dr David Starkey who's a kind of TV historian in Britain and he, he takes the view that there was a, ba a wrong turn taken in the teaching of history in Britain and the turn was into non-narrative teaching uh, i.e. not uh, 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 teaching the story of a nation and also that it, it then became constant analysis of sources so as to understand that what history is is a collection of sources all of which you have to be sceptical about and try and understand and I can understand why the history teaching moved that way but you have a very difficult situation in teaching in Britain I can't talk about teaching in America but teaching in Britain whereby my own children uh, at school, up until the age of 13, were taught um, uh, Henry VIII and the Tudors, the, then the next year the Home Front and the Second World War, and the next year the Egyptians, and the next year the Renaissance, and the next year, you know. So they, they kind of get these bits, and it's incredibly hard. At one point, this seven-year-old uh, friend of my daughter's said to me, okay, Hitler, was that taught me through before or after Henry VIII? <laughs> and and, 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 and I've, got, I've got a huge sympathy with that, because... It's just bits coming at you all over the place. Um, you know, and the old-fashioned way of teaching history was story of a nation. You know, this is, you know, we go through and you understand who you are, where you are, as a, as a narrative story. And I, you see the success of History of Britain that Simon Sharman presented for the BBC, and you see that actually I think people do want that. You do want to understand things. You know, the only way you can understand your own life is as a narrative development. Your own life doesn't come at you as... This bit, and then you go. You know, it's a narrative, and and so I think that that insofar as it's taught um, in a non-narrative way, I kind of wonder about that. But but I'm not an educator in the in that professional sense, so I, hard for me to say more than that, really. One of the ways in which we talk about individuals who were involved in the Holocaust or any other genocidal uh, event is in terms of the perpetrators, the victims, and the, I can't remember what the middle is called, the, the outsiders, observers. Bystanders, yeah. Bystanders, Bystanders, which is by far the largest group among the three, and always is. And in psychological literature, there's a, a, a concept of actors, critics, and uh, again, bystanders, observers. You've done something that is different from most of the rest of us sitting in this room. You've been an actor. You have been a, someone who directly set out to present to that large population of people who don't know that much about it, but who might care if they did know more about it. And I think you deserve a great deal of credit for that. Well, thank you. As does Victor for bringing you here. Oh, thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it, thank you. Well now, uh, let's get the other side of the story. Uh, you've ruined my morning because uh, I, my favorite movie almost is The Bridge on the River <laughs> Alec Guinness, 
And now I've got to go home and I drive back to Kansas City and think about the fact that he didn't blow the bridge. He didn't didn't really do it. Uh, Going back to your opening remarks, your remarks a minute ago about age 13 in history, elaborate a little more on that because I I think we uh, have a great failing in America too about uh, the the importance of history and teaching our children. Would you talk a little more? Why did that come about at age 13 in Great Britain and all of that, Larry? It, it came about because um, there was a decision taken in terms of the, the, the two big public exams you take in Britain are GCSEs at 16 and, and A-levels at 18. And uh, the, the, the GCEs uh, begin to be taught at 14. It's a two-year course. So what they would do, they decided that there are certain core subjects at GCSE that children should have and on that two-year course, and history wasn't a core subject. That's the key decision. So the government decided it wasn't a core subject. The government decided. Yes, yes. Now, what's interesting about that is that it doesn't stop. You know, there's, we have a system in Britain where you have state schools and you have private schools, and private schools can teach, teach broadly what they like. They can choose to make these decisions, but they, but again, in in pretty much every school I'm aware of, history is an option. And I remember when I came, I came over here and met with uh, the American people at the American Historical Association in Washington. It was a fascinating insight to me because, as I say, I don't know a great deal about how history is taught here, but it's fascinating insight. And because I was interested in the website I was making about World War II to have a sense of how World War II and this kind of history were taught here, so I thought I'll go to the American Historical Association and go along, and they received me, and they're very gracious and very charming and nice. And uh, and I said, so I'd just like to know what the syllabus is for. Uh, um, this history teaching in American high schools. And this guy said, I think, tongue in cheek, he just said, are you a communist? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry? He said, well, that's communist talk. Where we come from, that's communist talk. I said, I'm sorry? He said, he said nope. He said, and he said something that very funny, which he said, John Wayne would not accept this kind of thing. And if John Wayne doesn't accept it, we don't, you know? And, and um, uh, I think he was teasing me, but, um, but, 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 so, but he then came to the point that he said, I, you know, here at the American Historical Association, I can honestly tell you I have not got the faintest idea how history is taught in American high schools, <laughs> because it's up to the American high school. I thought, whoa, this is quite a, you know, is that true, is it? It is genuinely upset. I said, so, so I thought, this is a very different system. My goodness, the system that we've operated on in, in Britain. Um, so, so, it, 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 is it right? Nobody in, nobody in America knows exactly how it's all taught, or no? They do. It has to do our federal system, because, and I served on the National Commission on Social Studies in the late 90s, which was an attempt to create a national curriculum. All oh, right. And we had the superintendents of instruction of each state was on this larger committee, was uh-huh. on the executive committee. Each state controls its curriculum. There's no national curriculum in the United States because of education is a state, not a okay. federal matter under the federal government. Right. And so there was this committee with a group, I represented the AHA, and there were senators on at the instruction, and we failed. Okay. And Arthur Link, a famous historian at Princeton, had done for us a study of the four previous commissions in the 20th century, beginning in about 1903, and everyone failed because of the federal system. One of the things that I discovered in that, I didn't know a lot about pre-college history till then, was that one of the conflicts was between, let us say, historians and state legislators who said the teaching of history is the teaching of civics, not the teaching of something about the past that's supposed to represent reality. So we require the teaching of American history in almost every state in, be, to create a sense of patriotism, not an understanding of the past. And historians who write the textbooks for those cooperate. And the publishers, anxious especially for the Texas and California markets, end up uh, distorting their textbooks in order to sell copies which are adopted by local boards of education, not even statewide. Statewide, there's a list of acceptable textbooks, and then each locality decides. So you'll find in Michigan, textbooks that tend to be pro-labor, uh, <laughs> so, well, so which is the only state. Yeah, so okay, so yeah. you, you have this mosaic of biases uh, at each state level 
reflecting more the political process than any sense of professionalism, either by historians or educators, who choose from what they are permitted to choose, but don't have a great deal, and there is no national. So no one can tell you what, without doing a study, what the national pattern is, and we have no way of actually imposing uh, a national curriculum. So how do you study, so you, when you study history here, you have to take it almost from scratch, that you, you think that they, they well, don't? Well, what, what we do is we do, as you say, you learn first about your locality, so we tend to teach state history like in the second grade. Then they take American history in grade five and then again in high school. We're the only country, by the way, that places an emphasis in most states on world history. Really? Right. And whereas um, that has a balance in most states, and we leave the United States out of world history, so it, it's an interesting distortion, but um, we tend to be less nationalistic in the world history. I've taught in Britain, and then um, at least at the Red Brick University. Right. Uh, and my children, my son learned in uh, King Edward School in Birmingham. Yeah, terrific school. Um, and uh, that tended to be very nationalistic. Yeah. How fascinating, because I think it's incredible, you see, I, I, in that, you see, I think it's just fantastic that here in Kansas you've got Victor, who is a professor of British history. He's not a professor of European history, he's a professor of British history. Well, I mean, you know, uh, Britain, uh, uh, um, and you've got several people teaching British, British history. Well, you know, I am British, deeply patriotic, but I'm telling you, you know, it's not, it's not a very big place, you know, and, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, you're a professor of British history, I mean, we do American studies in, in, and so on in, in British universities, but um, there's a slight difference in, in, in scale here. So it's, it's, it is tremendous that you're that outward looking. But no, so, so to answer your question, that's, it's, you know, I was going to say, is bad, you know, you, the, the, the celebratory history better than no history? I guess it might be, actually. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by how you wrestle with the, the whole question of Native Americans, though. I found that when I was at the, um, I shared with some people yesterday that I was at the Western Heritage, I got an, uh, 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 the National, uh, um, uh, I was inducted into the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, 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 as a result of a film that I was involved in on the Oklahoma land runs that won Cowboy Film of the Year at the Western Heritage Awards in uh, Oklahoma City, and, and we went out there and got this. And I, I was just fascinated at how that museum that was based on the Western heritage tr tried to deal with uh, the issue of Native Americans. And you can see as, you know, apparently there's a d discipline called, I only, I don't know, it's called museology, which is, I, it's, isn't that wonderful? I'm studying, I met someone who's studying museology and it's laying out exhibits. You know, and um, and I, I think in terms of museology, it must be a great challenge to try and work out how do you deal with the whole Native American issue in the context you kind of want to be celebratory, and it seems to me that America is celebratory about the nature of independence and the nature of expansion and the nature of the cowboy, and the, it's got all sorts of positive values, but they were kind of, sometimes they were killing these people over here. So kind of, well, okay, how do we, how do we fit in to the celebration of cowboy film of the year and cowboy of the year when being a cowboy had a kind of a bit of a downside sometimes? I'm a museum person. Uh, several years ago, there was something called West as America, which was at, in Washington and caused enormous controversy because the underlying pinnings were the settlement of the West and the repression of Indians came almost entirely from Eastern entrepreneurial interests <laughs> and were far more uh, prevalent than, than that kind of patriotic, you know, the frontier. Uh, it caused a furor right. in the United States and continues to do so. I think that Indians still are beaten feather rom romanticism when they're discussing it, but within Kansas, there is a greater, at least in eastern Kansas, within my experience, there's a greater uh, sense of trying to make Indian history one's own. That because you are a Kansan or Missourian, 
that that's your history too, which is very ironic considering the terrible situation at Haskell and the almost oblivious sense of community responsibility towards them. Yeah, I don't know how you, so you, t you teach, I mean, I don't even know what the correct term is. You're Native Americans now, is this how they, um, or, or An Indian, Indian will say it's okay to say Indian. Really, okay. But, but the, the, the political. The political correct term is Native Americans. Isn't it? Correct. Okay, so you don't, it keeps or, changing. And in it's Canada, like, it's first Americans. It's so funny because it keeps changing. Yeah, because it keeps changing. It's like um, forms of disability that they keep changing because then the word then becomes a problematic word. So it really changes every now and then. It's extraordinary how the euphemism. But, but, but so you, you teach, um, they're taught um, Indian history. Be, so they're taught that the history of Kansas doesn't begin with um, white people arriving. It, it begins with. Okay. It, 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 um, it begins, it doesn't only begin with, but an emphasis is made on the moment of contact. Right. Right. Let's get really con contemporary. What are your thoughts on what's going on in the Middle East today oh, as a historian? Do you know, one of the great, I got into terrible trouble with, I think it was with a, a very leading historian when I, he, he said, why do you, we're talking about what's the value of history. And I said, well, more and more I think about it, fundamentally I think history is a comfort. And he went crazy with me because he said history is challenging. It's like, really, yeah, comfort you. Just, you know. and, um, and the reason it's a comfort is because uh, uh, when I study the, the, the Holocaust, it's terrible and awful, and I see people, but I'm not then asked as an individual today, now, to do something about it. And I, and I because I can try and understand and, and get things from it and feel for it, but it's, it's gone, it's there. I can't, I'm not asked to, to, to get to the barricades for it, which I show maybe, maybe a great weakness in me, but, but then I was on a jury for uh, the... British Academy Awards for Best Documentary a couple of years ago, and there's a film about AIDS orphans in South Africa that was up for an award, and I had to watch this film. And it's all about these little children of seven, eight, nine, who are having to cope on their own, because all their family, their extended family, has been killed by AIDS. And I was just in pieces at the end of this film, and desperately upset and, and miserable. And, and, and I was thinking, why am I in total pieces about this film, in a way that somehow, when I'm dealing with a lot of this corrosive, horrible material about the Nazi past, I, I doesn't, I'm not like this. And, I, and the only reason I could understand it was because I wasn't, I'm not asked to do anything about what happened in the past. But I feel terrible about those people suffering now, and they're suffering this second, and I'm not doing anything about it, and I don't know what to do about it, and I feel impotent about it. Um, and I, so I feel the same about the Middle East, and so I feel kind of, I'm just incredibly fortunate. I don't have to um, go and work out what to do about, you know, about the Middle East because I don't think I, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't think I have a clue. So, Lawrence, thank you for coming here today.